This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are discussing with Mark Moyer his recent book, Strategic Failure, How President Obama's Drone Warfare Defense cuts and military amateurism have imperiled America. Mark Moyer is a historian and expert on U.S. national security. His previous books include A Question of Command, Counterinsurgency from the Civil War to Iraq, and Triumph Forsaken, the Vietnam War, 1954 to 1965. He has served as a consultant to senior leadership of U.S. Special Operations Command, U.S. Central Command, and the International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan. Mark, I'm glad to have you on the program. Yeah, thanks for having me. Mark, a question that comes to mind uh, to begin the interview, the title of the book, Strategic Failure. Yet as I read through your book, what, what kept coming out to me, it was not so much strategic failure, but really the absence of any strategy or the absence of any sort of ideals or Uh, I say ideals, but any sort of touchstones that would guide uh, American foreign policy by the current administration, ends that they would seek, and then the appropriate tailoring of means to seek those ends. What do you say? Well, that there is uh, a lot of truth to that. The you know, there's still a lot of debate going on about what exactly Barack Obama has in mind for his national security strategy, and we've seen conflicting impulses. you know, at times he seems to be for democracy, promotion, and human rights. At other times, he's not for it. Um, you know, there's some people think he is just sort of naive. There's others who attribute more of a uh, a left a desire to promote a revolutionary ideology in various places. Uh, I think we don't, you know, fully know what's going on in his head. Uh, and certainly, as a historian, you know, I know it, it may be 50 years before we appreciate some of this, but but what we do see is that um, there is, in general, a tendency to, to react in a crisis management mode, which we've seen in other presidents, especially uh, Bill Clinton, that rather than having some kind of overarching strategic framework, by and large, the president reacts to crises as they pop up and I mean, part of his reactions, I think, are driven by how he views the world. Part of it certainly is driven by political calculation, uh, you know, what's popular in the polls, what he thinks will make himself look good to history. And so as a result of that, you know, we have very reactive policy, and, and uh, I think, you know, history shows that if you're simply reacting to the crisis of the day, that you're not going to have a proactive, strategic approach to the world. On this score, what I was thinking of, uh, the recent the statement he made, I think tug-in-cheek, a year over a year ago, uh, with, with regard to Syria. And you know, famously, we, we know in Syria, he gave issued a red line if chemical weapons were used against the Syrian population by its government. Uh, you, one would assume America would act if that line was crossed, It was. Nothing happened. And I think around that time, Barack Obama said his policy was don't do stupid stuff. Yeah, that's right. And that's, uh, you know, he's got these kind of principles like that that um, motivate his decisions. Again, even in that case, uh, I mean, it's there. There's more to his thinking than simply uh, trying to avoid mistakes. But certainly that's been a a recurring theme and that he he views most military interventions as being stupid, and so that's why we see him so reluctant. And even most in within his party now, I think, have come to the conclusion that he is excessively reluctant to take uh, active measures, military measures, to uh, to deal with the world's problems. And this is you know, slowly catching up. I mean, when I started the book in 2012, uh, a lot of people still thought he was pretty good on national security, and so over the course of writing the book, a lot of these problems have, in fact, led to you know broader failures, and we're seeing now that really the unraveling of the world in 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 a lot of different places. Thinking though, 
Yeah, yeah. You mentioned you began writing the book in 2012. 2012, I think, largely public opinion on his foreign policy was that things had gone pretty well. Uh, but And that's also relative to what had happened under the previous president and how public opinion judged Iraq and Afghanistan. I think it's fair to say, I mean, maybe it's hard to state exactly what people were thinking, but it seems to me they judged what, what had happened in Iraq and Afghanistan as, if not a waste, something that had just been uh, kind of a, a quagmire, a failure, and they wanted to put it behind them. And so Barack Obama really did seem to have something to work with there in the sense of pulling back American policy and, and you know disengaging from these places. It seemed he had public opinion at his back in that regard. So there seems, you know, there's something to be said for what he was doing. Uh, if, you, if you took the position that we were overextended and weren't actually accomplishing any uh, real American objectives in the war, uh, against Islamic terrorism, save for nation building or holding together the territorial integrity of Afghanistan and Iraq? Well, I think that there is something of a mythology that's come up that uh, Obama himself has, to some extent, cultivated, that he was basically elected in, and took office in 2009 because of this broad opposition to the conflicts. But if you actually go back and look at the 2008 campaign, uh, While well, he opposed Iraq, he was actually talking about ramping up the war in Afghanistan, and he, in fact, did go ahead with a major surge. So the public was not, I think, as averse to these conflicts as people in hindsight often think. Um, now, certainly Iraq, he did come in talking about how it was a mistake and he was going to fix it, although even there, you know, he didn't pull out the troops as fast as he wanted. But I, I fault him for... You know, failing to educate the public on what was going on. You know, people look back and say, well, 2011, Americans were no longer interested in Iraq, but, you know, Iraq was pretty quiet at that time. And in fact, you had the Obama administration actually claiming credit as, uh, of Iraq as this big success. Yeah, and yeah. so, why I, part of why I wrote the book was simply that I saw that, uh, especially the withdrawal from Iraq in 2011 against the advice of the military, was setting the conditions for. For failure, and uh, that failure came, you know, sooner than we anticipated with the uh, with the rise of ISIS. And in Afghanistan now, more recently, we're seeing the consequences of pulling out more rapidly uh, with the Taliban regaining cities, and uh, you know, we're now the administration looking at possibly rethinking about uh, you know whether it keeps some troops there longer than uh, originally planned. Yeah, no, and maybe I didn't express myself well. It, it seems to me there was a very, very much an open question in Americans' mind about what exactly our war was in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan. And you know, with Afghanistan, you still had Osama bin Laden, it seems to me, in the public mind, who was there or you know, just across the border. Uh, and there was actually an active threat there, whereas in Iraq, what you had was a Sunni-Shia war that American soldiers were somehow caught in the middle of it, were policing or going out in Humvees and getting blown up. And I think to that extent, Barack Obama walked into uh, a situation where his uh, lack of a strategy or a pullback strategy in uh, certain places or, or, or overall had, was, was found fertile ground because somehow Bush had convinced many that nation building was kind of a conservative Republican thing when no, actually, conservative Republicans had always opposed nation building, but that became associated in the public's mind with our with our foreign policy, and that that sort of created this opening for him to walk in. Yeah, you know, I certainly Iraq was never as popular as Afghanistan, and I do think uh, certainly across the political spectrum there were people dissatisfied. I mean, you know, in in hindsight, I think you know, even most Republicans you know would acknowledge that the the original decision to go in was was mistaken. You know, there was this belief that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction that he turned out not to have had, and that the uh, the region was more stable when you had Saddam Hussein there. And, and so, you know, the United States had to go in at a much greater cost, and uh, than we would have liked. And so, I think you, certainly there was 
you know, reason for the public to be dissatisfied. But the, the problem with Obama is that he comes in in 2009, and the situation has largely been rectified. And so whatever you may have thought about the original decision, the United States has now invested very heavily in Iraq, and we were in, I think, a good position to sustain those gains at relatively low cost. And the military was you know, advocating we keep troops there to hold things together. And I think they had a persuasive argument. Because if you look at what was going on early in Obama's tenure, the U.S. military did use its power to restrain the sort of sectarian impulses. Uh, and there was a feeling with on the part of Obama and Hillary Clinton that after 2011, we could use a 16,000-person uh, U.S. civilian presence to do the same thing. But it turned out that you know, the civilians just did not have the clout. And as soon as we pulled the military out, the Maliki government, you know, thumbed its nose at us and pursued this very sectarian agenda, which led to, you know, purging of Sunnis from the military and uh, uh, oppression of the Sunnis, which, which opened the door to ISIS. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, talk about Afghanistan, uh, you know, recently. I mean, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal, I think, Monday, of uh, a certain village uh, in Afghanistan that Afghan troops in conjunction with American soldiers were trying to reclaim and had failed uh, the Taliban presence there had been successful. Uh, but I want to, before we talk with about that, there's, a, there's an incident you report in the book, or I say an incident. Uh, at the beginning of the Obama administration, he appoints James Jones to be his national security advisor. And, and I thought this was such an interesting uh, point you, you uh, note, report on. And James Jones was shocked, and he said, I didn't even you know, really know him. And he would pick me for this, you know, obviously incredibly important position in his, in his administration. What did you, what do you make of that? Well, I think he was just a, you know, one of many sort of politically self-interested moves on the part of Obama. And you know, part of, too, why I you know, decided to, to write this book was, that uh, there has been sort of the tendency within much of the media and certainly uh, on certain parts of the political spectrum to sort of view Obama as being you know, somehow different from your your average politician and somebody who's not concerned with you know narrow self-interest and we see just unfortunately so many times in the, in his national security policy how he puts you know, his personal interest, his the, the Democratic Party interest ahead of you know, really doing what's what's good for the country. So in the case of Jones, it was uh, we want to find somebody that we can put here and say, oh, well, we've got a a, a, milita- a senior respected military officer um, so that we can demonstrate that we have some commitment to the military and some credibility. You know, later on, he I mean, people like Jones, uh, Pet- uh, David Petraeus, Bob Gates, they're all kind of pushed to the side. And so you, you now have a situation where there is very little military expertise within the top levels of the administration. But, you know, it's now in second term, and, and the president's less concerned about those optics at this point and is now just focused on pursuing the policies that it feels uh, comfortable with you know, ideologically and in terms of showing what the president's legacy will be. Yeah, you quote um, uh, fairly extensively at points, uh, James Jones, uh, Bob Gates, uh, I think I remember pretty well, um, you know, certain you know, people who had been involved in national security as a matter of their careers uh, that Obama held over or appointed into these positions. And they note, uh, feeling on the outside, an incredible dissatisfaction with their level of involvement in these decisions. And, and what they note is, uh, you know, people with political backgrounds being the people that the president goes to, uh, David Axelrod, uh, you know, Ben Rhodes, Valerie Jarrett, others. Uh, do you, did you find that to be, I mean, when you, when you talk to people about that, it seems to be a similar type of a criticism was leveled against George W. Bush, particularly in the run-up to the Iraq War, that it was an you know, incredibly political decision as well. Uh, wh- how do you m- make up the, the sort of a comparison? Well, I certainly think I- inherent within our government, there are... It's unavoidable, you know, the, yeah. The, there are... And, and anywhere you go in Washington, you know, there's there's political hacks, and then there's the wonks. And, the, you know, the wonks are the ones who have the, 
you know, bright ideas and, and are more focused on the national interest and the hacks are more concerned about partisan politics and making political leaders look good. And so I think in any administration, you're going to have a, a certain amount of that. Uh, I think, and, you know, people like Gates have talked about it, I think it's was it's been worse within the Obama administration than in than in some of the others. You know, I think uh, George W. Bush. You know, if you look back, I think there's there's greater indications that he was willing to do things that were politically unpopular, like the the Iraq surge. Um, you know, things that could potentially be quite harmful to him. Uh, you know, he was himself fairly reluctant to get into Iraq. I think there were certainly some some hacks around him that were were pushing things. Um, but I think, and, and again, from a historian's perspective, you know, our, our views may change on these, you know, over time. But I think, yeah, in the case of Bush, he was probably a bit more attuned to the national interest and less sort of preoccupied with, with his own uh, self-interest. You know, another example you can look at is, you know, people thought he should have fired uh, Rumsfeld earlier, and that would have been politically advantageous for the Republican Party. Uh, and he waited until after the uh, 2006 midterm election. So uh, I think history will probably look better on on Bush. You know, I think Obama. If you look, you know, so many people who've been inside the administration have talked about how the uh, you know, desire to boost Obama's poll numbers and his first term to, to get him reelected were were such a driving factor. And you had, you know, uh, you know, the Dennis McDonough's and Ben Rhodes, who were very much focused on the president's personal popularity, uh, driving decisions over the objections of uh, the career professionals. Uh, no, and I, I mean, interest. I mean, you know, think, uh, you know, gossip game or back and forth. But I, I mean, I think what's interesting in your book is, uh, the degree to which people uh, have talked about, who are in the administration, have talked about, you know, feeling as if you know politics above all was, you know, was was placed as the guiding consideration. Seems that that's, that's a good criticism, and uh, will be discussed uh, uh, as you say, as Obama's legacy, whatever that means, unfolds. Thinking about Afghanistan, what did Obama? When you think about the surge. And uh, was 30,000 troops are committed to Afghanistan. You note the first meeting between Stanley McChrystal and Obama. And McChrystal feels or, or perceives that Obama is relatively uninterested in what's going on or doesn't really have too much of an interest in discussing uh, the agenda with him. What, what did, did you make of that something uh, along the lines of the James Jones uh, uh, appointment that he, though this is just something he's doing because he thinks it's you know, uh, advantageous, uh, but he shows relatively little interest in it. Yeah, that's right. And we hear, you know, hear from a number of sources that Obama is just not very interested in military affairs. And I think, uh, you know, I'm a believer in the theory of emotional intelligence that, you know, the more interested you are in something, the better you're going to be in it. So yeah, he seemed disengaged uh, in that case. Uh, you know, Gates has said that really the only military issue that was of much interest to Obama was, was gays in the military. And so, uh, you know, Afghanistan was clearly something he did for political expediency. And he, you know, to appease his liberal supporters, he made clear from the beginning that this was a, sh- was a short-term measure. And that really undercut the value of it from the beginning, because uh, in, in a place like Afghanistan, the, your military commitment has a great psychological impact. And so, most Afghans, after so many after so many years of war, are very opportunistic, and they they tend to want to side with whoever they think is going to be there for the long haul. And so, it seemed early on that the United States was in there for the short term, and that caused a lot of Afghans to uh, either hedge their bets or just to to uh, side with the Taliban. And and you know, it, the Obama administration also was, I think overly hasty to try to turn things over. Is that I've argued uh, in one of my previous books, I you know, talk about what it takes to to win a counterinsurgency, and you need to to turn things over to the locals, but that's usually about a 10-year process at minimum because you're going to need to cultivate new leaders. Now, in, in Iraq, you already had a, a seasoned cadre of, of Iraqi leaders that you could turn to, but Afghanistan didn't really have that. So, 
we, what we're seeing now in Afghanistan is the result of the, the rush to the exits, which has left Afghanistan without enough of the experienced leadership, especially in the police, to uh, to sustain things. And, and so I think just a few more years of commitment would have certainly put Afghanistan in a better position. So, uh, but speaking in Obama's favor here, it seems public opinion itself wasn't in favor of such a strategy or law. You, you say 10 years, or we could say three years or five years, seems from my read of public opinion, Americans didn't really believe that was their war. What did Obama conceive as being our war when he ordered the surge? Well, I think, uh, you know, I think we need to keep in mind that public opinion is heavily influenced by the White House. And so if the White House goes out and makes a case that we need to do something for an extended period, a substantial element of the public will go along with it. But what we had instead from the White House was a consistent message that we want to get out quickly, um, and there was not much other communication. And so I think that led to demoralization. I think you could have certainly built some more public support. You know, we've kept huge numbers of troops in other countries for decades, you know, Germany, Japan, Korea. Um, so it's it's certainly not implausible. You know, and I think a lot of it has to do with how many casualties there are. I think the American public will tolerate a prolonged commitment if there are not many uh, U.S. casualties. And, and when you shift to more of a training role. You know, if you look at Iraq, by the time Obama came in, there were not many casualties. So I, I, I don't think it was out of the question. I mean, certainly there was a, a, a degree of war fatigue, but, uh, you know, I'd also point out that the, you know, the number of Americans, the number of American families with people who actually uh, served in Iraq and Afghanistan is very small because of the fact that we no longer have a draft. So I think it's, you know, a little bit problematic to say that the American people as a whole are are weary. Now, the, the, the families that have sent people, I think, certainly have cause to be weary because, you know, one of the adverse effects of the all-volunteer force is that we end up sending the same people to these wars over and over again, and, and so there is a, a problem of burnout. Yeah, no, I mean, I wonder, though, you know, as, as I uh, think about this, we, you know, it, to my mind, it's like we have two faltering strategies, maybe, and we're missing the one thing we can do. And, and that's what the American people are responding to. And that is, why, do we have an interest in a stable Afghanistan? Is that something within our means to achieve? Or is, you know, what's in our means to achieve is kill the Taliban. That's our war. And once that's, once that's accomplished, or once they are disabled, then we leave. Uh, and I wonder, getting caught up in, in something like territorial integrity, that's what the American, which is seems to me a, a fleeting objective, and that's what public opinion responds to. But of course, then Barack Obama responds to that public opinion by not not making the war we could make and just leaving an area. Mm -hmm. Well, there is, uh, and you know, certainly one of the major themes in the Obama's first term is that there's this shift towards the view of, of Vice President Biden that we can basically focus on just killing off the terrorists in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and not have to worry about you know, the broader issue of who's controlling the country. And, you know, I think if you look, you know, as I go into the book, you know, probably no one in history has been better and more effective at this surgical strikes against terrorists than Stanley McChrystal, but he himself, you know, disagreed with Biden and, and said, basically, you can't just go in and do these surgical strikes because, uh, you know, the enemy is, is capable of rebuilding, re, regaining um, personnel. And, and, and a lot of the insurgents in this case were in Pakistan, where our ability to do drone strikes and other things was limited. And so, um, you know, the, we actually, you know, pursued this strategy of, just try to go after the extremists in the early years of Afghanistan, and, and the Taliban was able to regain control of much of the country. So I think, you know, if we think we can simply rely on drones and special operations to continue to, you know, 
hit these terrorists in, in places like Afghanistan, I think we're we're in trouble. I mean, we've probably, I think we've been fortunate there haven't been more major strikes so far. I, 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 t- I tend to think that the in, in the case of Afghanistan and Pakistan, they're probably waiting until the U.S. pulls its remaining forces out because, you know, if there was, if uh, Afghanistan or Pakistan originated a big terrorist strike on the U.S., um, the that would be certainly a reason for us to keep our troops there, where it's going to be a lot harder for us to to put our troops back in once we've taken them all out. Um, yeah, I think you rightly note you have a good discussion in the book about this idea of drones and special forces, uh, and you note how special forces and drones matter very little without uh, a conventional military force around them, providing all sorts of support roles, protection. Uh, et cetera. So I, that, that strategy seems to me, it's, you know, it, it, it seems to get you something, uh, but you have to put much on the table. And it seems to me that's probably why Biden uh, and Obama went for it. As, as you note in the book and the discussions over the strategy in Afghanistan, there were very few people for the Biden strategy. It seemed to be the political players and most of career military and career strategic thinkers opposed it mightily. So I, I appreciate that discussion. I guess, you know, my, my question is thinking about what is America's war? You know, if you think you need to kill Taliban in Afghanistan, then you, you would send in a lot of troops and, and you, would, you would provide a lot of firepower and you would eliminate them as best you could. But you, you wouldn't stick around to prop up a government. And I, I just I wonder, I keep thinking that's that's got to be what we're doing wrong in the sense of why, why we never seem to get anywhere. But we're wasting a lot of time with these potentates who, who are basically worthless uh, and we're not, we're not actually achieving our war. I, I want to ask you, uh, in just thinking about uh, recent events uh, in Afghanistan, the drone strike a- against the hospital uh, that happened, um, was it late last week? Do you see that as, you see that as poor intelligence, um, or do you see that as something, what do you make of that episode? Well, I think from, from what I can tell, I mean, certainly part of the problem appears to be that we were relying too much on the Afghans, uh, and this is a problem we've seen for decades. Uh, one of the things that we have the most trouble doing in, with our allies is is getting them to uh, be able to direct these airstrikes accurately. I mean, we've seen this also in Iraq. It's been a big problem, and so that's one of the main arguments for why you need to have some Americans on the ground helping out in these places is because you just don't have the the capability to use precision weaponry. Um, you know, I think also, yeah, yeah, and, you know, the, um, I mean, part of it too is simply that, uh, you know, when you're going to, ha- if you're battling it out in the middle of a city, you know, it, things like this are going to happen because the, you know, the and the enemy knows that, you know, they can get a big propaganda gain if they're fighting near one of these facilities and it gets hit. Um, so. I think it's uh, it's unfortunate, um, and I think it's probably an argument for why you need to have some you know, significant U.S. presence. I mean, if you look, another place that's interesting right now is uh, in Yemen. We've basically just let the Saudis do that themselves, and what we've seen in the case of the Saudis is is you know much more damage to the civilian population. You know, lots of airstrikes hitting civilians, and so if we think we can, you know, outsource these things to other countries in the region, and and that you're not going to have civilian casualties, I think we're we're kidding ourselves. On uh, that, that's interesting. That brings up something I want to discuss with you. Um, in, in this sense, so you mentioned Yemen. We've also got the crisis in Syria, and we just negotiated a nuclear agreement with Iran. The, my question to you is, is part of Barack Obama's strategy now to say, okay, we have a, we have a, uh, in effect, a Middle East war that knows no national boundary. I mean, we have basically rump Iraq, we have rump Syria, and, um, <clears throat> and we have Shia and Sunni Muslims fighting one another throughout the region. And so he is, in effect, saying, okay, there's nothing we can really do there. All we could do maybe is give one of the players in that war that seems to have the most power 
some sort of authority maybe to help resolve or to help police the region. And strangely enough to Americans' ears, that answer is Iran, which is now going to have, you know, X amount of capital with with sanctions relief. Uh, We'll soon have a nuclear weapon. And we're leaving the region, and maybe this is a way to try and leave the region uh, with with Iran having more power. Is that, you think that's at all in in his mind? Uh, I think there's certainly a good chance that, you know, this is another issue where I think there's still a fair amount of uncertainty. I mean, some of the, what you hear out of the administration is that the Iran nuclear deal isn't going to change much, that we're still going to, you know, try to contain Iran and that, uh, you know, we'll punish them if they go too far. But then there are certainly other indications that we are thinking that we can uh, turn over at least some of the region's problems to them. And there's, you know, there's also been talk about Russia playing a bigger role. Now, that that was before the Russians you know, came in all of a sudden with this major military intervention, which I think has caught the administration off guard. Uh, you know, I think there is a real question of does the administration really have some kind of coherent strategy, or or is it just uh, addressing issues in isolation? You know, I think the Iran deal. I think there's reason to suspect that the Obama administration viewed this as kind of a Nixon Nixon in China event, and that it was something that was going to show he had a, a foreign policy legacy because he's had a lot of foreign policy struggles, and that it was done without necessarily considering what all the ramifications would be uh, for the region. Uh, we certainly now do see Iran, uh, Syria, uh, the Shiite government in Baghdad seem to be on the ascent, but you do also have the Gulf countries, you know, Saudi Arabia, um, certainly not going to roll over and simply accept uh, Iran dominating the whole region. Uh, and of course, there's certainly the question, too, of, of Israel and how they are going to deal with these new developments, and uh, and the United States certainly still does have equities in the region, and so I do think we're going to we're, we're heading for more trouble as as we you know our influence is going down, um, but we still do have stakes, and certainly I think the problem of ISIS is something that we're still going to have to to deal with, and uh, so I think we we see uh, you know, there's a lot of reason to be concerned about what's uh, coming ahead. A question for you on American interest in the Middle East. As I see it, I mean, now I I think the ultimate agreement or the ultimate result of the agreement, as we've been discussing, I think is an intensification of conflict in the Middle East. I think that's unavoidable. As you note, the the Sunni states aren't going to take that lying down. Iran is, I mean, you know, it's a minority. Uh, You know, Shia Islam, I think it's outnumbered 10 to 1 um, in the region. So they're looking for not only influence, but ways to help their friends in the region. And they've now achieved some of that, I, I think with $150 billion, it's been rumored that they'll, they'll now have. So okay. that, that's, all, that's all going on. We look at Russia. Um, I guess I, I suppose what Russia's doing in Syria doesn't bother me if I'm right, which is um, Russia's interest in Syria is just to keep kind of a rump government because it's vital to Russia is this port. Uh, that, that, that Syria controls, and it wants to have some sort of Syrian government that can help protect the port. And in that respect, it's going to, uh, you know, murder the enemies, you know, take out the enemies of of that regime, uh, which will probably be, uh, in certain respects, ISIS, but will be, of course, other factions as well. So, seems to me may not be such a bad thing, uh, even though press coverage over here is, you know, particularly conservative press coverage is that this is you know, shows up Obama and blah blah blah. Uh, but I'm not sure why that's such a bad thing. But you know, ultimately, the question, I guess, for us is, what are our interests in the Middle East? Uh, and this kind of comes back to Obama. One thing I think he did right, although there's nothing really much to what he's done, is the idea of the Asia pivot, that this is sort of the future of, of American interest in the 21st century. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, certainly there's questioning of what U.S. interests are. Um, you know, Given what's been going on with fracking, there's a sense that, you know, the Oil is no longer as a big a deal for us, uh, although yeah. you know we should also keep in mind that uh, you know at some point 
you know, U.S. may do what the Europeans have done and cut back on the fracking uh, for environment, environmental reasons. So oh, I think we've got to be a little careful of that. Uh, and um, uh, but certainly terrorism is still an issue. ISIS is, is I think, a real threat. And you wouldn't have seen Obama sending troops back to Iraq if, if he didn't think it was a threat. Uh, certainly the alliance with Israel is uh, is something that's not going away. And you know, Americans may debate it, but I think that's going to be uh, something that's going to keep the U.S. Uh, engaged in the region. Um, you know, there's also the tie between, you know, the Middle East and Europe. You know, this refugee issue is, is I think, causing serious problems for Europe. You know, the debate with the Germans trying to force refugees on the other states, and Europe is a, a you know, key interest of the United States. And so, it's important for that reason. I mean, I think the question of Russia is an interesting one. There are people who are saying that, you know, that Russia may provide stability in, in Syria, which could be good to some extent for for that part of Syria. But there is also uh, the question of what's going on with the, the Sunnis in, in Iraq and Syria and, and ongoing violence. I think we're going to certainly see more Sunni-Shiite violence. So I think also... The Russia issue is important simply because uh, it's tied to what's going on in Europe, and I think what happens in you know, the Middle East has a bearing on 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 Europe. I think you know there's recently an article written by uh, an Estonian politician who talked about how you know, what goes on in Syria affects the credibility of Russia and the United States in in Europe, and really the you know the United States is. I think at this point, all that stands between Putin and the Baltic states, uh, and it also affects what's going on in Ukraine. So the fact that Putin's gaining and, and the United States is looking humiliated, I think, does have a bearing in uh, in Eastern Europe, which is, you know, an area certainly of concern for us. How do you think Obama sees, I mean, uh, I mean, the uh, uh, general categories here, Obama sees Putin, I think, as uh, acting uh, as a realist. For certain Russian objectives, but he's not a he's not a um, uh, a neo-Soviet uh, foreign policy roller. He's not trying to actively constitute some sort of empire in Europe. Uh, he's he's securing certain territories he thinks are important to Russia. It seems to me Obama's okay with that, and and that the stakes are too high otherwise. And you know what's is is there something really at stake for American interest uh, with what he's doing? And it seems to me Obama just says no. Yeah, I think Obama certainly. Yeah, I think he's afraid of Putin. I mean, we see. You know, as soon as the Russians went into Syria, you heard all sorts of statements from the administration that, well, we're not going to provoke the Russians. We're not going to do anything. And it was similar to what happened when Putin went into uh, Ukraine, um, which. You know, I think the Ukraine was more problematic, and we had this Budapest memorandum that pledged us to protect uh, Ukraine, and we just ignored that. And I think the Baltics gets us into a whole new category because they're part of NATO, and I think that could be, you know, what happens if Putin goes in? I mean, what, what's happened in Syria and Ukraine, I think, gives him reason to think that uh, Obama might, again, do nothing. But if you know, um, NATO member states are invaded and action is not forthcoming, then you've got a, you know, the NATO alliance you could be dead. And then if you're Poland, what do you do? Uh, so I think there is a uh, real reason for concern. And I think if you're Putin, you see that, you know, the next U.S. president might be tougher. So maybe you try to keep grabbing as much as you can while uh, Obama's still in office. How do you see Putin and in, in, in his ultimate objectives for Russia uh, in this current campaign? Do you see him ex- trying to keep extending it, or he's got Ukraine and that's fine? Uh, and you know, Syria, there's a, there's a, there's a Russian interest there. We we discussed that, but do you see him kind of as an expansive uh, uh, power player? I yeah, I, I do think he certainly aspires, you know, uh, for for Russia to regain influence closer to what it had in the Soviet era. Um, you know, I don't think he's quite as uh, you know, extreme as you know, Adolf Hitler, which you know people are drawing comparisons. But there is, uh, you know, there are some disturbing parallels. And if you look in 
you know, one of the things, again, with the Baltic states is you've got sizable Russian minorities in those states that Putin can exploit, uh, which is similar to what you know, Hitler did in the 30s with the German minorities in uh, Eastern European countries. And so, uh, you know, I think Putin, you know, I think if he's really confronted um, that he will not push too hard, I, you know, I don't don't know that he's going to, I don't think he's going to launch an invasion of Germany necessarily, but he's certainly pushing into the Baltics. And I think, you know, we're already seeing that countries in Central Europe, you know, Germany is, I think, been trying to be become more accommodating to to Russia. And so I think Putin envisions uh, Russia becoming much more influential, you know, almost to the point of where it was in the Soviet era, um, at least within Europe and the Middle East. Um, you know, it doesn't have the same sort of revolutionary ideology, but, but uh, you know, I think he has a vision of of Russia becoming, uh, again, uh, a leading world power, and uh, and Obama seems to be allowing him to do that. Yeah, recently I was reading, you know, someone suggested Israel has already acknowledged this reality uh, and in regards to the Middle East and America pulling back, and so they've now uh, trying to cut a deal with the Russians for their security. Uh, I think there's, there's certainly some indications of that, you know, that within, uh, you know, Within Israel, there's some who are there's you know debate on that. Some who think it is a good idea. Others who think that Russia is too close to Iran. But um, you know, certainly we've seen. You know, it's been interesting to watch. You know, all the leaders in the region. You know, seem more interested to meet with uh, Russian diplomats right now than with American diplomats. And so, uh, clearly, there is certainly some sentiment within Israel to warm up to Russia and and to hope that Russia can exert a restraining influence on uh, Hezbollah and and, uh, and other anti-Israeli forces in the region. I want to just briefly here, uh, kind of towards the end of our interview, I mean, one of the things that Obama said he believes in uh, is, is the Asian region, the China Sea, and thinking about China's power and influence. And, you know, we're, I mean, there's, there's stories every week about what China's doing. Uh, vis-a-vis its neighbors and disputed territories and islands. How do you think uh, uh, Obama understood his China pivot? Is it something that he's seriously committed to? Has he committed the resources and the means to achieving anything? And you know, what in the world are we? do we really hope to achieve in that region, given China's presence and the fact that they really have a really impressive Navy now, um, missile capabilities, et cetera? I mean, what do we really hope to achieve? Well, I think, in theory, the... Asia pivot had some made some sense in that if you look in the region, you know, most of the countries besides China are are wary of Chinese power and look to the United States to offer them certain protection. And so the theory was we were going to move more military assets there, but because of sequestration, we ended up not being able to do that. We kind of kind of held where we were, and that. Uh, you know, ironically, that talk about the pivot to Asia actually accelerated Chinese military spending because they thought we were going to be ramping up. And so now you see uh, certainly China, and I think partly encouraged again by what they see elsewhere, they've certainly become more aggressive. I think, you know, the, the building of these artificial islands and their claims to territorial rights are really becoming problematic. And we're now hearing talk that the U.S. is going to move uh, warships into areas that the Chinese are claiming, uh, which I think is probably, you know, to some degree necessary because if, if we start to allow China to simply flout all these rules, uh, we're going to see again a lot of the countries there are going to lose confidence in the United States. Uh, now, Japan right now is taking a, a fairly tough stance against China, and we'll see how that develops, but that, that could also change. So, Certainly, you know, the Chinese have been fairly crafty in how they're going about all of this. They're kind of pushing things, uh, you know, asserting rights, with, but trying to do it, doing it to the point where it doesn't seem overly provocative. Um, but I think, you know, at, at some point, um, if the United States doesn't take a stand on some of these things, then uh, its influence in uh, Asia is also going to, to start uh, 
going away, which I think in the long term, uh, you know, the Obama administration talked about how you know how important Asia is economically to the United States, and so I think uh, certainly it would be to our detriment if if we uh, you know, lose our our position of uh, of power in the region. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose the question ends and means keeps coming up to my mind, and do we really do we really have the means at this point? Uh, uh, well, I mean, our, our navy is uh, has shrunk. And, you know, it, the question comes to mind, could we really bring it about or do we invite uh, a crisis uh, by, you know, I, I was reading this recently, this moving the warships and do we invite a crisis we're not yet ready to address or we can no longer address, uh, which seems to me a, a dangerous course of action. Yeah, well, and, you know, I, a lot of this goes back to the to sequestration of the defense budget, which I think, you know, I argue in the book that, that Obama really wanted to gut the Defense Department, and he did it sort of surreptitiously through sequestration. And so we are now you know, headed down towards and below 3% of GDP on the military, which is near historic lows. And so I think even if you just went back up to 4% of GDP, which now a lot of Republicans are talking about, we could, you know, fix a lot of these problems and you know we could certainly have the strength in the, in the Pacific uh you know and I think you could easily go up to 5% of GDP um you know which I think is still pretty reasonable you know historically we've spent you know in the cold war it got up to 10% of GDP you know at some point obviously you you start to question how much you spend and I think certainly um you know conservatives have right to to be wary of excessive government spending, uh, there's always a certain degree of inefficiency to it. But, you know, 4% of GDP on defense is really pretty modest uh, and, and and affordable for the country. Um, and, and I think this, again, is something that Obama has, you know, I think part of his desire to remake America was to get the U.S. out of major military spending um, so that money could be moved into domestic programs as it has been done in uh, in most of Europe. Yeah, no, but sequestration, as you note also in the book, though, a lot of Republicans, the majority of Republicans, voted for it. Well, they you, they were promised by John Boehner that uh, it was not, that they would be able to actually avert it. So you had a lot of, you know, there were a lot of the more hawkish Republicans who were very suspicious about the possibility of cutting defense, and they got a promise from Boehner that he was going to make sure that the sequestration triggers didn't actually go through, um, which turned out not to be the case. The Republicans were not able to deal with that. But there is certainly the Tea Party element within the uh, Republican Party was more comfortable with it and was willing to uh, sustain major cuts to defense because they also included substantial domestic cuts, although it left alone the entitlement programs. It was mostly, uh, you know, most of the domestic cuts were made to programs that had previously been inflated by the Obama administration. So really the uh, Defense Department was the big the big loser out of all of this. Um, but certainly I think there is, uh, you know, still questions within the Republican Party about, um, you know, where the party wants to go in foreign policy. But you, it is interesting that... Uh, you know, I think the ISIS issue has regained some of the yeah. interest in a stronger defense. I mean, Rand Paul is no longer, uh, you know, his influence seems to have faded, although certainly Trump has, Donald Trump <laughs> has been yeah. espousing some more, uh, somewhat more isolationist lines, although he does talk about a strong defense, and I think that's what, you know, most of Republicans can agree on, that you need to have a certain amount of strength in defense, um, as a deterrent, because you know that's part of th- this administration's thinking is that we, uh, you know, disarmament is the path towards peace. But typically, we've seen you know dis- when the powerful disarm, then others come in to uh, to take advantage, and then the United States usually ends up having to rearm, and uh, and and that's behind the curve. Yeah, no, I mean it, it was funny. I, I guess I interviewed uh, about half a year ago, Brett Stevens on uh, his book on foreign policy, and he made the case for 6% of military spending of GDP, or 
And I, you know, my question to him was, what do you want to do with it? What are, what exactly are the, the goals, the ends that you're going to pursue? And I think that's the case that has to be made before the American people would be open to accepting that and be willing to acknowledge also, look, we do have major entitlement problems, spending problems that we've got to deal with as well. And so there's, there's an adjustment there that has to be made and, that adjustment, if those cuts are going to be made, but you're going to increase military spending, then a significant public case has to be made for what one would, would actually do with it. Um, I think the American people are open to that, but it hasn't been made yet. We're certainly not seeing it in the Republican primary. So. Right. Yeah, I mean, I do think um, Marco Rubio has been pretty, uh, has done a, a pretty good job of, of stating the case. I think most of the other candidates are, uh, you know, haven't talked that much about it, uh, but um, yeah, certainly I think it's something that the Republicans will need to do. But I think also, you know, the, the president has you know a great deal of influence. I think if a Republican gets elected uh, and you have the Republicans control in control in Congress, I think certainly uh, there there will be opportunities yeah. to to re- restore defense. But there is again by the time by January 2017. Our enemies may have t- done a lot more. Uh, you know, Russia and China, I'm sure, are, are making plans to get as much as they can while the uh, getting's good. Yeah. We've been talking with Mark Moyer, author of Strategic Failure. Mark, thank you for your time. All right. Well, thanks for having me. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.